Chapter 6, Southeast Asia and the Pacific Region, Cultures and History. Diversity. There's many different people who live in these countries, and they develop their own cultures uh, in early times. So, got the countries we're going to be talking about are Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, Indonesia, and East Timor, which is this tiny part of this island here. Now, India has had a major impact on Southeast Asia because Indian traders came in, and when they did, they brought things with them, uh, long lines of things like religions. They brought actually Hinduism, Buddhism, and then Islam. So Hinduism was the first starting point, uh, the earliest of the religions. So one of the main empires of the region was something called the Khmer. They were Hindu, and this is probably their most famous uh, ar architectural feat, which is called Angkor Wat, which is from the Khmer period, and it's a Hindu temple uh, complex. So later on, Indians brought Buddhism to the region, and after that, Indian traders who were Muslim also spread their faith. So this is what the map looks like today. And if you look here, we've got uh, the sort of the pink area here is Islam. We've got Buddhism right here. We've got sort of traditional religions still here. Hinduism up here by India. That's India. Uh, and then we have Chinese religions down here. And then over here, Christianity. Now, China was mainly in south, uh, northern South Viet, uh, Southeast Asia, which is uh, Vietnam in particular. And they adopted uh, some things like Buddhism, but also uh, some Confucian beliefs also. There's a great variety of religions. Uh, that's just what I said before in terms of the mainly Buddhists are Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, mainly Muslim, Malaysia, and Indonesia, mainly Christian, and this is due to missionaries that came out when Spain was in charge. It's the Philippines, and Singapore is a big mix of all these, and Hindu, Hinduism as well. Uh, colonial rule in Southeast Asia, traders wanted to gain control of the silk, spice, iron, silver, and pearl trade in this area that was to be called uh, East, the East, East Indies. So a uh, tremendous amount of money could be made, especially if you were using boats, because then you could pack a lot of stuff in, instead of using the overland trade of uh, what was called the Silk Road. I wanted to cut out those middlemen. So they started with trading posts, but eventually took over the areas. This is how Southeast Asia looked around 1914. We got France in control of this area, which later on becomes called French Indochina. We got the Netherlands down here in uh, what becomes called uh, Indonesia and Portuguese down here. This area was called East Timor. That's kind of important because it uh, became independent not too long ago. It actually fought a pretty uh, vicious uh, uh, campaign from the, uh, from the Indonesian government when they were in charge. And they became independent. A lot of that had to do with the fact that Portugal was in charge of them at one point. Got Great Britain here as well in Myanmar and up here in Malaysia. And uh, over here again, uh, Thailand's independent and they remained independent for quite a long time. So colonial rulers, one of the things to understand about them is they're trying to make money. So they, they, did, uh, they did improve some of the things, but that was for their own ends on some level. Transportation for trade, building ports and railroads and things like that. Uh, they also built schools so there'd be skilled workers. Now, they were sort of like Gandhi on some level, but different in terms of the early independence movements in early uh, 20th century. They did not get very far. When, uh, when World War II came along, that shook everything up because Japan invaded and took control of almost the entire region. See what I mean? Almost the entire region. Didn't quite get to Australia. They wished they had, but they did not. Post-World War II, the Japanese got kicked out when they lost. Colonial powers wanted to take back control. Nationalists wanted control of their own countries. So some got independence peacefully, the uh, Philippines and Burma, in particular, uh, some had to fight Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Malaysia, and Indonesia. Probably the most vicious fighting happened in French Indochina, and what happened there was that the France came back when after World War II was over and said, hey, we want these back. They fought from really 1946 until 1954, uh, sort of an insurgent groups that wanted to go ahead and get independence from France. And uh, the French had a really bad defeat at a place called Dien Bien Phu, 
where they got surrounded and uh, tens of thousands of them died and eventually uh, so did tens of thousands of the Vietnamese died, but but eventually they surrendered and that kind of pulled them out. Now Vietnam was divided into the communists in the charge in the north and the U.S. backed non-communists in the south. South Vietnam was supposed to have an election uh, on who should rule it, but the U.S. canceled it, partially because they thought that uh, that they would reunite with North Vietnam under the communists. Vietnam, uh, the U.S. sent military advisors first and supplies, then they started sending troops but then more and more troops until they had hundreds of thousands. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty nasty war, partially because it's televised. And we'll get more to the Vietnam War in a little bit more detail later. And this is during the period of the Cold War, so Western countries were about the spread of communism. So when France stepped out, kind of the U.S. stepped in. Vietnam was lost to the West, but was reunited under Ho Chi Minh. That's that guy right there. And... Almost uh, 14 years of U.S. involvement could not stop the North Vietnamese from being able to take over the South Vietnam eventually. U.S. withdrew and they became fully unified and the communists under Ho Chi Minh. And uh, Saigon got renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Now Cambodia and Laos, they got ca caught kind of in the crossfire here because uh, they were on the border with Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam. In North Vietnam, they would go ahead and have some, some stuff go through uh, South Vietnam, but a lot of it they would go down something called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is right here. And they'd go through Cambodia and Laos, and that made it so that they could supply the people that were uh, doing guerrilla war tactics in these areas. And that really irritated the U.S., because the U.S. were fighting against them. So. Uh, the U.S. bombed those areas because they felt they had a right to, uh, particularly under Nixon. So, in a Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, the Communist Party was called the Khmer Rouge. They were really anti-technology, forced people to move from cities to farms. Eventually, they were kicked out, and now they have a democratic government. But this guy here who looks so happy. His name is Paul Pot, and he's responsible for uh, the death of about a million people who died under the Khmer Rouge. Pacific region. The Pacific has hundreds of islands. Lots of them are inhabited. And they settled the area bit by bit. Uh, Australia got settled first, and that was during the Ice Ages. And then these other areas got settled bit by bit. Uh, and you can see uh, Hawaii was one of the last to be settled. Now, settlement New Zealand, the earliest group was called the Maori, and they're uh, distinctive for their uh, dark tattoos and uh, geometric designs on the, that they wear on their arms and faces and things like that. So. Um, so they're really distinctive in the way that they look. They lived in New Zealand for about a thousand years. They were mainly hunters and farmers, but they fought each other a lot, so they had the reputation of being warriors as well. The Australian Aborigines, they were the, the earliest settlers, and they came over maybe 40,000, maybe 50,000 years ago. Primarily, they're hunters and gatherers, but they farmed a bit. There's not a lot of, of uh, rivers in Australia, so it's hard to farm, not a lot of rain either. So... Um, so they hunted and gathered instead. They believed in the importance of religion, uh, the religious belief in the land, uh, and uh, similar to Native Americans. And when the British show up, they find a penal colony, which is a remote place for criminals that you don't want in your country. So they kicked them out and sent them down to Australia, figuring that they couldn't get back. And more people came by choice and looked for a golden land. By 1901, it became independent. The British settled in New Zealand and by, 19, by 1840 took control, uh, but New Zealand did become independent in 1947. Now most of the people who are in New Zealand are now descendants from the British uh, settlers. Uh, both groups have high standards of living in different industries. Now the Aborigines, they really suffered a lot under European rule in Australia. Lots died due to disease. Uh, they were forced off the land and forced to work on these large sheep and cattle ranches called stations. Uh, children were taken from families and brought up by Europeans. Less than Today, they're less than 1% of the population. And this is actually a school where they were taught to be more European. And in Australia, in Australia there's a lot of different groups that start moving in. So we got here uh, people who consider themselves to be real Australians. So I guess uh, they've been there for quite a while, for generations. Then you have the English and all these other groups that came in. It's a lovely amount of data from Wikipedia. So, 1970s, uh, well, after World War II, different groups came in. 1970s, the Vietnamese came in. If you look here, that's the amount that there's Australian Aborigines that are left. So, Maori, the British promised uh, to protect the land for the natives, but they did not. The uh, natives fought 
uh, the settlers and uh, the settlers won. And the Maori culture nearly died out, but it's now recovering. Laws now protect their religion. Just like Australia, lots of different groups immigrated to New Zealand. Now, the culture of the Pacific Islands, gradually they were able to settle in each group of the islands. However, since they were far apart, they developed unique cultures, but they all relied heavily on the ocean. Countries like uh, Germany, U.S., France, and Britain claimed the different islands. They wanted them for trade posts and naval bases. After World War II, this became really important. Um, just, uh, well, during World War II, it became really important uh, because of the Japanese, uh, and even before that, for coaling stations. And when they uh, became independent after World War II, most of them did, uh, the most people on the islands adopted English and are Christian, but they do keep some of their culture, and that is it.